Before I begin, I would like to thank EGRU for inviting me to give this presentation on the application of recent innovations in exploration geochemistry. The emphasis of the presentation will be very much on the application of some recent concepts uh, that have been developed over the last decade to look at uh, exploration geochemical data. So uh, thankfully, not a lot on theory in this presentation. I've broken the presentation into three sections. I'll begin with a discussion of the use of clay fractions separates in superficial geochemistry. And I uh, would like to acknowledge uh, E79 resources for permission to talk about some soil data from one of their projects in central Victoria. And I would also like to acknowledge Lab West who provide the ultra fine analysis for that project. The second component of the presentation uh, will discuss the correction of stream sediment geochemical data for variable lithological background effects without using the geological data that would normally be applied in, in doing these corrections using a conventional approach. And the third component will be a discussion of some of the things I've learned um, about machine learning in exploration targeting. Uh, and for those last two components of the presentation, I'd like to acknowledge financial support from Geoscience BC to undertake that work. And, and also I would like to acknowledge the British Columbia Geological Survey for providing the catchments used in those projects. And in the case of some of the work, it was undertaken while I was employed by CSA Global. Before I begin, as president of the Association of Applied Geochemists, I would like to put in a plug for our group. Uh, we've been around since 1970. Previously, we were known as the Association of Exploration Geochemists. Um, some of the advantages of being a member of the AAG include um, subscriptions to our journal, Geochemistry, Exploration, Environment and Analysis, uh, we also have a newsletter called Explore, which contains short technical articles as well as information on what's happening in terms of applied geochemistry around the globe. And we're also a contributor to Elements Magazine, which is a very useful magazine for anyone interested in geochemistry and petrology. So let's get on to clay separates. And the question arises, why would we use clay separates for superficial geochemistry? Well, I can illustrate that simply with the scatter plot on the right hand side of the screen. These are minus 80 mesh, so less than 177 micron diameter um, stream sediment samples from the Yukon. And uh, they've been analyzed uh, for gold and they've used um, neutron activation data in this case. But you can see that if we compare the original analysis with duplicate field samples, that the data are almost entirely um, chaotic. There, there's no reproducibility in any of the, the data here. And, and so the, um, the problem is that sometimes you might get a high value, in which case you're lucky because the duplicate from that site uh, was probably below what I would consider to be an anomalous threshold of 10 ppb gold. Um, alternatively, the, the original sample may have come in below detection limits, um, in which case, if you hadn't done the field duplicate, you would have missed um, quite a significant anomaly. And this just represents the erratic nature of of the, um, the distribution of gold in these samples. So the use of clay separates is supported by sampling theory. And sampling theory di dictates there's really three ways that we can increase the precision of our analysis. Uh, one is we can take a bigger sample, so a larger mass. Uh, the second is to reduce our grain size and, and therefore reduce the grain size of the particles that we're interested in sampling. And the third is to increase the number of particles that we're interested in sampling. Uh, in other words, increase the grade of the sample. Well, we, we don't have any control on that third component. So really there's only two things we can do. One is to increase the mass of the sample, which has some logistical consequences, or we can reduce the grain size. 
No, um, traditionally this was difficult to do. Um, and it was historically restricted to sample size, say less than about 63 micron. Uh, the Geological Survey of Canada did a lot of work uh, using this fine grain component in till samples. But the recent introduction of the use of uh, centrifuges for separating out clay size material um, uh, has allowed us to get right down to uh, sub 10 micron grain size on a routine basis. The result of that is a significant reduction in the nugget effect, particularly for gold. So if you contrast that to the data I've just, just talked about on the right hand side of the screen, uh, which was totally random in terms of the distribution of gold, um, we, can, we can moderate that nugget effect Plus, we'll, we'll get an enhanced anomaly to background uh, distinction for some elements. So a few shots here from the preparation facility at Lab West. Typically, what I've been doing in terms of soil samples is collecting a minus two millimeter size fraction in the field, sipped in the field, uh, collecting about two to 300 grams of that that is dried and shipped to Lab West. There it undergoes chemical dispersion and settling of the coarser grain material. The clay minerals or clay particles are retained um, in solution and, and that solution is drawn off and it, it is that solution that is then centrifuged to separate the clay from the water. And in the upper right hand side of the screen, you can see some clay separants that have resulted from centrifuging and to separate them from the water. That clay fraction is dried and it undergoes a microwave assisted digestion of about a half a gram in, in acaregia acid at about 180 degrees and 20 bar pressure. And then that solution is analyzed by ICPMS. And in the case of gold, we have a, a lower limit of detection of about 0.5 ppb. And on the bottom of the, the uh, two photographs is a shot of the lab uh, where samples are, are prepared for microwave digestion. I first delved into the use of clay separates in 2011. I undertook a orientation survey and had the samples analyzed at uh, what was then Acme Labs in Vancouver by Bill McFarlane. And, um, we wanted to compare three different size fractions for stream sediments. So we collected samples um, that were feeding off the golden saddle and coffee gold deposits in the Yukon. And then we collected um, a, a standard minus 80 mesh size fraction, took about a half a gram of that for ICPMS analysis. The reason we did that was at the, at the time of uh, both Geoscience BC and the Yukon Geological Survey were interested in reanalyzing archived pulps that had been collected over many decades by various surveys in Canada. Uh, and um, this was typically a minus 80 mesh grain size fraction. And, and they were in the process of starting to reanalyze these by ICPMS. But typically the, the amount of material analyzed was about 0.5 gram. Once we had that minus 80 mesh grain size fraction, we took a kilogram of that and subjected that to a conventional blood analysis. So bulk leach extractable gold. And then we did a, a, a clay fraction extraction as well. And, and that underwent an acroregia digest and ICPMS analysis. And as you can see from the scatter plot, comparing results from two field duplicates, the, the only sample type to give reproducible results for the clay size fractions. And this, this convinced me that we were onto something looking at the clay size fraction in terms of, of being able to reproduce gold values, uh, certainly in field duplicates. The other advantage of using a clay separate, which you can see in this plot, uh, which was provided to me by Lab West, um, it's a comparison in blue of a 25 gram acroregia digest and analysis for gold um, by ICPMS uh, compared to a clay fraction from the same samples. Uh, and uh, 
that subject into microwave assisted uh, acroregia digestion and then analysis by ICPMS. So you can see the patterns are broadly similar, but in, in orange, you can see that the, the differences between the lows and the highs are much larger than we get uh, if we are just looking at a, a, the um, 25 gram acroregia digest results. So we're getting an enhancement of that peak background um, uh, contrast, which is useful in terms of trying to define um, geochemical anomalies spatially. Now, um, separation of clay size fraction and analysis has been commercially available in Canada, at least uh, for approximately 10 years. It's only recently been available in Australia. As far as I'm aware, it's only offered uh, by Lab West. And, um, and some of the, the theoretical and conceptual development of the method uh, was undertaken by CSIRO. Uh, Ryan Noble and his team uh, did some of, the, um, some of the investigative work into this. Uh, and one of the things they did was they looked at a variety of different digestion methods and recoveries of gold in, in different types of material. In, in the, the box and whisker plot on the left, we're looking at data from three different study areas, but they also looked at recoveries of gold from certified reference materials as well. And what they found was the microwave-assisted aquaregia digestion gives a slightly better recovery of gold in the samples uh, across a range of different matrices. So the, in the end, uh, Lab West decided to go with the microwave aquaregia digest. Now let me have a look at a, a case study from Central Victoria. Central Victoria or Victoria in general is comprised of a variety of different structural zones. And um, the area that we're gonna be looking at is in the Western Lock and Fold Belt in the stall zone. It's expiration license 6454, uh, which is uh, a license owned by E79 Resources. And you can see also on the diagram, there are a number of uh, currently operating uh, gold projects in Victoria, in central Victoria, uh, including Fosterville, which has uh, um, quite recently got into some very high grade material and uh, making it one of the most profitable gold mines uh, anywhere in the world. So we're looking at a project near the town of Beaufort. So we're just inside the stall zone uh, directly to the west of the Avoca Fault. So we're located here. And if we zoom into that area, we're looking at a, a gold field that is historically known for the production of alluvial gold. Just over a million ounces of alluvial gold was recovered. But unusually for central Victoria, the, at, at the heads of the gullies in which alluvial gold was being recovered, there were no productive quartz reefs discovered as there were in, in Bendigo and Ballarat. But you can see from the distribution in yellow of, of the shallow historical alluvial workings and some of the deep leads, the, the longer lines that are coming away from this area, that they're shedding off a, a central ridge, the Camp Hill Range, which runs down just about the middle of the exploration license. So that appears to be the source of the gold for the alluvial systems, and yet uh, no significant bedrock source has ever been found in, in this area or anywhere else in the immediate Beaufort region. So we're gonna have a look at the central grid, which is in this area here. And we'll zoom in on some results from that soil grid, um, which consists of residual soils that have been subjected to um, clay separation and analysis by ICPMS. And what we're looking at here is the results of a 100 meter by 100 meter soil grid over this central area. And it defines a number of 
trends, these are trending roughly parallel to the stratigraphy. So they could potentially be stratigraphically controlled. Um, this is a, a gridded percentile um, image using a weighted sums model with importances of two for gold, uh, one for arsenic, one for antimony, and one for lead. So the original survey has actually been able to pick up quite subtle geochemical anomalies that appear to be associated, probably associated with uh, pyritic black shale horizons. Um, exposure is quite poor in this area. In fact, some of the only exposure is where historical prospecting pits have been put down in, in some of the, um, uh, the upper um, ridge areas looking for the source of the alluvial gold. And once we had defined those trends, what we did was we came in with some infill. We did the infill on a 25 meter spacing. And so now we're just looking at the gold. Uh, the values are not um, eye popping. The, the highest value in fact we had in this grid area was about 90 parts per billion gold. But the point is that the gold values are quite reliable. And, and so we can plot them up like we would plot up any other element, essentially. And uh, we can have some confidence that you're dealing with real numbers. So here are our two stratigraphically controlled trends that had been defined by the uh, reconnaissance survey at 100 meter spacing. And you can see we, we see that also in the infill. But in addition, the infill is indicating some areas of elevated gold which appear to trend obliquely to that stratigraphic trend and suggest that these trends might uh, be structurally controlled. Uh, we'll have a better idea in, a, in another few weeks uh, because currently um, some of these targets are being drilled and uh, we'll have an idea of what sits under the weathered zone and is producing the geochemical. It is an area of nuggety gold and soils, as you can see from a small nugget sitting on that um, a GPS. That's about a two gram nugget. Uh, one of our soil samplers, uh, Dave Kiley, is a detectorist and he occasionally will go over in some of the areas that we're sampling in and pick, pick up gold nuggets in the soil. So you can see we are dealing with a nuggety distribution of gold in the soil. Um, and if we plot the field duplicates from the program, you can see com if you compare this to the previous data we had for the minus 80 micron samples, stream sediment samples from the Yukon, you can see that we've got relatively good reproducibility of field duplicates. We can quantify the improvement in precision by looking at uh, the relative precision, which is double the average coefficient of variation. I've calculated this for gold and for arsenic using the ultrafine fraction from this central Victorian project. So I'm, I've got two values here. I've got a value for the laboratory duplicates and also for the field duplicates, <coughs> excuse me. And you can see in the field duplicates, the mm -hmm. relative precision is about double what we're getting for the arsenic values. Uh, but by the time we get to the lab duplicates, the, the, um, the relative precisions are very similar. Now we can contrast that to data from that Yukon project. So now we're looking at minus 80 mesh stream sediment samples. And if we look at the field duplicates, our relative precision for gold is uh, 121%. So significantly higher than we're getting with the ultrafine fraction. And we can contrast the gold data to the arsenic values. And in fact, the repeat, repeatability of the arsenic values is in fact better than we're seeing in the central Victorian project. Uh, but it's, and it's almost an order of magnitude lower than we're getting for gold for that project. And critically, when we go to the lab duplicates for that project, the, the arsenic um, relative pre precision drops a little bit, 
but the gold relative precision is still poor at 116%. So, so not really a great improvement, even when we look at lab duplicates. And finally, we can contrast the relative precisions for a typical gold project, a coarse gold project, in this case, one from uh, an area noted for its nuggety distribution of gold. And in this case, we're looking at pulp duplicates, uh, so minus nominal minus 75 micron grain size. And from core duplicates, we're getting a value very similar to what we were seeing for the stream sediment samples, over 100% relative uh, precisions, and really only dropping around to 38% uh, uh, when we look at the pulp duplicates from the project. So you can see the, particularly for the lab duplicates that we're getting with the ultra fine fraction, it's, it's probably better than we're getting from um, other gold projects and comparable to what we're seeing when we're looking at other elements in the sample, such as arsenic. One of the things we do routinely is we include some certified reference materials with the soil samples so we can just keep track of the, um, the uh, consistency and accuracy of the data that we're getting from the laboratory. And in this case, you can see that I've plotted it two ways. I've compared it to the expected recoveries for an acroregia digestion for the certified reference material. And you can see the goal values from the microwave assisted um, analysis exceed what we would expect for a microwave, sorry, for an acroregia. And the dash line is the certified or expected value. And we're actually approaching what we would expect for a fire assay. So that's that dash line in this, this other run chart. So, so we're getting a, a better goal of recovery than we would expect from a standard acroregia digest. Um, and that's consistent with what's been demonstrated here in Australia through work done by CSIRO. Uh, not quite as good as the fire assay as, as we would expect, um, but getting pretty close. So pretty good recovery of goal. So to sum up some of the conclusions from this project in central Victoria, um, what I'm finding is the clay separates are providing uh, better precisions compared to, say, a conventional minus 80 mesh uh, grain size that you might use on soil samples. And that's even in spite of the fact that we have nuggety gold in the soil. Um, the microwave assisted acroregia digestions are uh, providing improved gold recoveries in, in the samples compared to a conventional acroregia digest. We're getting good anomaly to background definition. Uh, that's, that's predicted from laboratory studies and I think demonstrated by the subtle anomalies we're able to define in, in the Beaufort project uh, using the soil data. And in terms of cost, um, the cost is probably similar to what you might be expected to pay if you had collected, say, a standard minus 80 mesh soil grain size fraction. And analyzed a, a 25 or 50 gram charge in order to try to compensate for the fact that you you know that uh, in the case of gold, you're, you're dealing with particulate gold and you're going to have a nuggety effect. So I'll, I'll finish up there and we can take some questions if anybody has any questions related to this. Now I want to, to look at a, another aspect, which is really just an enhancement of uh, traditional ways of, of, um, of dealing with data. The example I'm going to talk about is, is going to be one that involves a catchment analysis <clears throat> approach to stream sediment data. It, essentially, uh, we collect stream sediments, they're, they're point data, uh, but they represent an area, they represent a, a, catch, a catchment. So, so if we take a catchment analysis approach to looking at stream sediment data, we essentially go from a point, um, point map to a catchment map, and then we can apply, however we decide to process our stream sediment data, we can apply that as a thematic layer to our catchments. In this case, 
This is an example for a project that we did for the Yukon Geological Survey, where we developed, um, in this case, an orogenic weighted sums model, and then we've we've um, thematically coded the catchments based on what percentile those weighted sum scores sit in, in the overall scheme of things. And we have a couple of things along that prominent uh, northwest trend running through the coffee and casino deposits. So we have a few known orogenic gold deposits in there, but we also have um, some porphyry copper style mineralization um, for example, at, at Casino, and but we have an overall trend running through there of, of elevated um, orogenic gold scores. So just a little bit of a background about the, if you like, the conventional approach to um, treating stream sediment data using a catchment analysis approach. Um, there's a lot of things going on that are affecting our stream sediment geochemistry. We've got catchment size, which is a if you like a, a proxy for the amount of dilution in the sample. Um, we have catchment geology, which may involve variable geochemical background. And, and then geology also feeds into relief and erosion. So that affects how different units are eroding. Uh, we have variable re relief, uh, which could be independent of, of the geology. So we have different erosion rates in different parts of the catchment. Uh, we can have scavenging of metals, um, by, particularly by iron and manganese hydroxides, but also onto clays, as we've already discussed, or onto organics. Um, there's the effect of stream water pH and EH determining the solubility of the different metals that, that might be uh, chemically dispersed within the catchment. And then, of course, what we're hoping to find is we might have some exposed mineralization within the catchment, and that defines our anomalous state of population or at least the one that we're after. But I'm going to focus primarily on the catchment geology and, and just step you through a, a conventional approach and, and then look at an alternative to that conventional approach. So the theoretical background for, for a catchment anal analysis approach goes back, well, it, it predate, predates even the work of, of Rose and, and co-authors. Um, in their exploration geochemistry textbook, which is goes back to 1979, the, the the basic thing that comes through whenever we look at stream sediment data is if you plot if you plot an element in this case, it, it's a score essentially a residual of copper above the expected background value on the y-axis, and we we plot that against the the area of the catchment we can see a rapid decay in those metal values as we move away. And, and when we get into the larger catchments, we're basically uh, defining a regional background value. So if, if we were doing a continent-wide geochemical baseline study, we would be sampling out in this area. We, we would be looking for overbank, overbank sediments to sample and, and to characterize regional geochemical trends. But if we're doing exploration, we're interested in these samples with the high or anomalous metal values, and we don't want to go too large in our catchment area. So for this example from North Vancouver Island, um, I, I made the um, interpretation that really anything greater than about 10 square kilometers, we we're probably getting too much dilution, and we were losing our, our mineralization signature in the data. Now, we, we can define all this with a, a chemical equation, which is known as the productivity, which is essentially the, the metal content of the eroding mineral deposit as a function of its exposed area in the catchment. Um, so a, a very theoretical concept, if you like. But the, the key thing is what, what we're looking to measure is we want to measure, we have the metal content of the sample, and we need to know how much above the background value that would be. And then we can account for dilution by multiplying, if you like, the difference or the residual from those two values by the area of the catchment. And the, there's a, an additional correction we can make, which is irrelevant if the deposit size is small compared to the area of the catchment. So we can, we can look at a simplified equation, which is known as the productivity. 
But really, the, the thing we need to resolve in, in trying to do this sort of work is we need to establish what the background metal content in the catchment is. So there are various ways that, that we can do that. I'm, I'm just going to show one approach because I, I think the, the concept of weighted averages is one that most uh, geoscientists would be comfortable with. Um, essentially, we can, we can take the data based on the areas of exposed lithological units within a catchment, and we can, we can work out what the background metal content would be for those lithological units. And then through a, a GIS query where we, we basically overlay the catchments on a, um, a geological layer or lithological layer of what's going on within the catchments, we can establish the, the different proportions of different units within the catchments. And once we know what the background values for each of those different lithological units are, For example, here we can calculate what the weighted average background value should be for that catchment for that sample. And then what we're really interested in is we have we have a measurement now for that sample. And, and if it's 100 ppm, given how high that is above background, well, then that becomes a catchment that we become very interested in. So that, that's a simple explanation of one approach to trying to work out um, where we have interesting samples within a stream sediment data set. But now I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a look at an alternative approach, and that's the use of principal components. So principal component analysis has been around a, a long time. It's a way of consolidating large number of variables in, into a, a small number of uncorrelated principal components. The, the first three principal components are shown on the diagram on the right or are orthogonal and, and basically represent the stretching of, of the data within a particular um, geochemical space. So we develop a series of linear functions that um, define those principal components within the multivariate dimensional space. Um, and this is becoming increasingly important to do because now routinely we'll get our geochemical analysis back and we'll have 40 or more than 50 different elements that, that we're looking at data for. So generally, I find it's useful to, to have a dimension reduction in the data so that I can, I can see what's going on. So, and, in, and typically, those first three principal components are going to define about 50% uh, or, or more of the variability in, in the data, and they can be related to catchment lithology. Now, the, the conventional approach has a lot of assumptions that we have to make. We, we have to know exactly where the samples were collected. That's not always a given. We're dealing with historical sample locations that, that weren't recorded using GPS. Um, so something that's been manually done on a topographic map, for example. Uh, we need to know the geology of the area. We need to know the lithological character of that geology of those units. And we need to know whether there's any uh, minor units that might have distinctly different geochemical character than, that might influence the data. Um, because we have, to, and we also have to assume that the erosion from each of those lithological units is related to its area within the catchment. So again, a lot of assumptions uh, and they're not always going to be correct. In fact, we, we know that they will seldom be correct, but it, it's what we have to do to get there. An alternative approach would be to use the principal components because the principal components potentially, not always, but potentially will contain recognizable geochemical processes in the data. So within the geochemical data, particularly now that we have multivariate data sets, we can see the effects of lithology, we can see the effects of metal scavenging, and potentially we can see the effects of mineralization within the data itself. So if we take a closer look at North Vancouver Island, and again, um, this work was carried out while I was with CSA Global and it was funded by Geoscience BC. We're looking at an area of Northern uh, Vancouver Island, just a bit of an aside here in terms of one of the advantages of a catchment approach to looking at stream sediment data. If you look at the yellow samples, which were the original samples collected by the Geological Survey, 
um, and then look at the red samples, which were infill, you would think that there was pretty good coverage already on North Vancouver Island. But when you relate those samples to the actual catchments that have been sampled, you can see that there are a lot of catchments that are greater than 10 square kilometers on North Vancouver Island. So you know, even within an area that looks like it might have been saturated with stream sediment samples, there are opportunities in catchments that have been undersampled according to the sort of, sort of uh, analysis that I showed previously. But the, the focus for this talk is really to look at lithological control. So um, North Vancouver Island is a known porphyry copper district, but it, it also contains a particular basaltic unit which postdates most of the mineralization on North Vancouver Island, that's the Kermutsen basalts, and they're shown by the pink stippled area on the left. So here's the Kermutsen basalts, and here's a, a percentile gridded image of raw copper data from North Vancouver Island, and you can see that the distribution of the Kermutsen basalts is largely controlling the distribution of copper in stream sediments. There, there are a few anomalies that we can see, and there are known porphyry copper occurrences and other copper occurrences on North Vancouver Island. And we can see in the raw data that some are showing up in the, in the, um, uh, in the stream sediment results, but not as many as we would like to see. And, and after the initial survey was done, uh, reading through the literature, I, I think the uh, geoscientists at the British Columbia Geological Survey were disappointed at just how little they could see because of this effect of the Karmuts and basalt. So, so the, the point of this study was to try to get rid of that effect. Oh, and we have some other things happening too. We have, a, uh, we have some gabbroic sills uh, affecting that area, which is why that copper bumps up a little bit higher. So if we look at the principal component uh, data from um, a, a selected group of elements from North Vancouver Island, and, and not just look at the raw data, but center log ratio transforms of the data. Now I've done that to partially address the effects of chemical closure in the data and try to remove any spurious correlations that might be affecting the principal component analysis. Uh, principal components are derived from um, a correlation matrix. So if we have false correlations in there that are due to geochemical closure, it's going to affect our principal components. And quite often before I started to routinely do a center log transform, I would get principal components that didn't make any geological sense to me whatsoever. But now that I routinely do a transform on the data, um, I, I find the data are much more um, amenable to interpretation. And in this case, the, the negative PC1 scores clearly in my mind relate to a mafic lithology. And critically, uh, within that association that defines that mafic lithologies, it includes copper, as you would expect. So what we can do is we, we can plot the copper, and I'm using a log scale on this particular diagram, against that first principal component. Now I've, I've inverted the principal component so that now the, the strong mafic response is, has positive values. Now I'll show you why I've done that when we look at a graph, or sorry, a, a map in a few minutes, <coughs> excuse me. But you can see there is a, a correlation between copper and principal component. One that can be related to lithologies of the units that are in the catchments. The, the important thing here is that, that the bulk of the data define a lithological association, but we do have samples that lie above that regression trend. So really what I'm interested in in a graph like this is I'm, I'm most interested in the positive residuals. So I'm interested in those values with elevated copper that lie off a trend that could be explained by lithological variation. And if we do a, a, a gridded percentile uh, image of that inverted principal component, one, you can see that it, it gives a very good response to the distribution of the Karmutsen basalts. So e even the raw copper data didn't pick up this area of Karmutsen here. 
but you can see we've, we've got even some small areas of Karamutsin standing out quite well. And it hasn't been affected by those Gibroic sills either. To the right is a plot of the residuals following regression of copper against that first principal component. So effectively what I'm doing with regression analysis is I'm taking to, to a great extent, taking out the effect of the Karamutsin basalt from the copper data. And you can see now that some of these known, uh, in this case, developed prospects are standing out quite well in terms of being associated with elevated copper. Uh, here's some others down here and down here. But, and a few, a few of these we could see fair enough in the raw copper data. But now, once we've filtered out that lithological effect, we can see a lot more in terms of mineralization in the copper. And we can compare that. We can compare the result from the regression uh, approach against the principal component with the more typical. Uh, I've just called them residuals, but this is basically the difference between the observed copper value in the stream sediment sample um, compared to the the calculated weighted average background value for copper uh, you would expect from that catchment. And you can see there there is there are differences in detail uh, when you look at it carefully, but they, they provide a comparable result. So in, in terms of conclusions, we, we can take a conventional approach, but for to use that, we need to have accurately located samples because we have to define a catchment for those samples, and then we're going to query the geology using that catchment. So if our sample's in the wrong spot, we're going to query the wrong geology, and, and we're, we're not going to get a good analysis. And we, ha we have to have a good map geology as well. And, and for those of you that are working internationally, you know you can go into areas now for exploration and there will be no published geological maps for those areas. So quite often the very information we would need to do a lithological correction to our data is just not going to be available. But a lot of the geochemical signature related to lithology is inherent in the data. And, and we can reveal that potentially through principal component analysis. And then if we do, if we have a, an element that is uh, part of an association that's lithologically controlled, we can do an, a regression analysis of that element against the principal component or potentially multiple principal components. So we can do a multiple regression analysis uh, against principal components. And, then we can isolate the residuals, and those residuals become the samples that, um, that would be of the most interest to us. And we can do this in the absence of any bedrock geological information. So again, perhaps a, a time to take a bit of a break and ask if anyone has any questions. I'm just glancing over to the... Um, Chat box. So, so Ben has asked whether we could um, apply this to hydrogeochemical data. Potentially, you could. Uh, I, I think, I think it, it comes down to if you have the data. You could undertake the principal component analysis, and then you would have to see if your principal components show you something that can be related or interpreted in terms of lithology. Uh, but there will be other effects in, in hydrogeochemical data as well. I've, I found, for example, the salinity of the groundwater will have a big effect on uh, what uh, cations you're, you're likely to pick up um, in the sample. So, um, I haven't done it, but I think it's something you can check very easily because doing the uh, principal component analysis can be quite, quite straightforward and simple, if, depending on whether you have the software to do it. Uh, the grant's asking how far down the, the, um, the, the number of principal components, because of course, if, if the number of principal components calculated will be uh, one less than the number of, of elements that you use in the analysis. So, so while there is a reduction in dimensions, it, it, 
it falls away very quickly. So I, I usually I usually look at a scree plot first to determine those principal components that contain most of the variance in the data. And then after that, uh, usually it falls away very quickly. It, quite often, I, I once you get past the first six principal components, you, you're really dealing with processes that are possibly a very weak, and that could be mineralization, or are, are essentially undersampled by uh, by your data set. Um, so you could go you can go further down into to some of the higher principal components to see if you can see a mineralization signature. That would apply to a regional data set. But if if you're involved in a say a project level data set where you do have mineralization, uh, quite often I will see the mineralization signature within some of the top principal components. Sometimes principal component one or two could potentially be your mineralization. So it all depends on the scale on which you're looking. The, the bigger the scale, the more regional your data, the further down the principal component list your mineralization signature will probably lie in because it's going to be very poorly sampled by regional data set. So the residuals I'm referring to, well, two kinds of residuals, and, and perhaps perhaps I've been a little bit loose with my terminology. So I, when I, if you think back to the productivity equation, uh, the the guts of it really are the the analysis that you measure minus the background value, and I sometimes loosely refer to that as a residual, uh, but really it, it's a difference, and 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 that's in contrast to doing the regression analysis and calculating residuals, which are, are true residuals, which are the, the difference uh, of the value off the regression line that's been calculated for the data set. Um, so I, I, I perhaps sometimes use the term residual in an inappropriate uh, fashion. So I've, I've used it in two different contexts here, if that makes sense. So now I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit about machine learning uh, and not from the perspective of someone who particularly understands the theory behind that. Uh, I, I work uh, with other people who are familiar with um, the theory behind machi machine learning. In particular, I've, I've, I've partnered up with Eric Grunsky, formerly of the Geological Survey of Canada, uh, who, who is an, an expert on advanced analytical methods. So I, I work with him to, and I rely on his expertise in the theory, but what I bring to the studies that we've conducted together is more of a background on application and the practicalities of, of, um, of how the data are obtained and what they, they partic particularly might mean in the case of stream sediment samples. So I, I grabbed a bit of a definition of machine learning off of Wikipedia. Um, there are many out there and I, I can't speak to a lot of these topics in any sort of detail, but essentially we're, we're, we're using machine learning to make product, predictions or decisions. Um, and there are a variety of ways to do that. And the reason I, I wanted to show this definition out of, or this summary out of Wikipedia is that things like artificial neural networks have been around for decades. And some of you may remember um, around the, the mid 90s, there, there was a flurry of activity around using neural networks to, to uh, help find mineral deposits. Um, I'm, I'm not aware that it was very successful and, and it fell away very quickly was my impression. Uh, although a few people continued to um, uh, to persist with neural networks and, and, and develop things like self-organized or self-organizing maps. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with some of the limitations I'll, I'll talk about shortly, but I'm, I'm going to specifically show you some results from using random forest, which, which is a multiple decision tree classifier. Uh, it's quite flexible in terms of the inputs that you could, you could use. And in particular, what I like about it is it includes an, an internal cross-validation. 
So if you, you can put a training data set in there, it holds back a component of data from each decision tree or classifier, and, and then you can go back and each, each of the decision trees can be rated in terms of how well it's done by going back and applying uh, that classification now to the, the data you've held back. So it, it does this internally. And so it saves a lot of time trying to do a validation of your interpretations uh, in a more manual way. Uh, it's non-parametric, so it means it, it's relatively insensitive to outliers. Uh, minimal user input, that's always a great thing to have uh, because the more input required, the more uh, variables that you as the person running the software uh, will influence. Um, so having minimal input, I think, is a, is a good thing. Um, and in addition to producing a classification, so in, in, in addition to say that a, a particular sample it seems to reflect this class of mineral deposit, it can also give you a, a, an estimate of the strength of membership to that class, uh, which allows us to, to plot the data in a, a useful way. And in addition, we can look at what variables it's using to, uh, for its predictions. Oh, uh, and thanks, thanks, Bob, for um, suggesting a, um, uh, a paper which uh, people could look at if they want to get a bit of theoretical background on things like principal component analysis. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in some of the practical limitations to using things like machine learning. Uh, one of the biggest, and I think the one that possibly um, held people back in the 90s in applying neural networks was the issue of data quality. Uh, and at that point, we had very high lower limits of detection for uh, some critical elements. Um, data consistency is another issue. If we're bringing, back, bringing together historical data from a variety of sources, that data may need leveling for various effects. Uh, and then we may need to apply some data transformations. Um, now that we have large multi-element data sets, we may need to reduce the number of variables, so that dimension reduction that I mentioned previously, and I'll show you how we, we've done that in one of the case studies I'll talk about. And then, to me, the critical thing that, that's impressed me uh, working on a number of studies with, uh, with Eric over the past five years is how important it is to get that uh, a good training data set. So it, it's, it's got to be a training data set that contains all the expected classes of, of mineral deposit that you might be looking for. There, there has to be minimal ambiguity to that class membership. So if you're dealing with, say, a, a government mineral deposit data file uh, and they're dealing with something that is classed as a showing, how confident will they be that that showing could, could be um, related to a specific type of mineral deposit. So some filtering needs to happen in terms of what, what samples or what deposits you're gonna bring in into your training data set. And also there's a problem where some of these different deposit types have a lot of geochemical overlap. So that means we can't resolve necessarily different classes of deposits easily. And finally, we need to have a lot of numbers. Our, our training data set needs to be big. So, so that's a big ask uh, in a lot of cases. And, and the work I've been involved in has dealt with generally large regional data sets. So that has allowed for uh, quite a large training data set. But even then, we've had problems. Critical thing about using some of these machine learning tools is it's not going to recognize a class that's not in your training data set. So we have to be careful that, that we don't all go racing down the machine learning track, thinking this is the way to, to um, conduct all exploration or all interpretation of, of geochemical and other geological data um, in, in terms of exploration, because it, it's very good at recognizing patterns that are, it's, it's been trained to recognize it's not going to find you something that's totally out of the box. Um, so we still need to have unsupervised methods of process discovery. So that, let me take a look at Northwestern British Columbia. 
this was a, a big area up, up in uh, BC. We had nearly 15,000 stream sediment samples. They had undergone reanalysis by Geoscience BC using a combination ICPMS OES. Uh, three different geological trains were involved. Um, and uh, then we had uh, some Mesozoic sediments of the Bowser, Bowser Basin overlying the, um, the, the Paleozoic rocks that contain most of the mineralization or earlier Mesozoic rocks. What we did have was we have a lot of mineral deposits and occurrences. So what we tried to do here was we tried to compare the use of conventional catchment analysis approaches with some advanced analytical methods. So, and we looked at a variety of analytical methods, but I'm going to talk about the one that I feel worked the best and that was random forest. So just a comparison here to show you the um, gridded percentile images of data um, using weighted sums models, in this case for uh, epithermal data, so uh, epithermal deposits, I should say, showing the pattern or distribution of, of elevated areas that we would get using raw data. The middle plot shows the, the same area and, and same data set now, but with a correction for catchment lithology. And on the far right is the random forest model, and, and here the input was centered log ratio data. And, and you can see right away that there is this area of, of known epithermal deposits really lights up in the random forest data. Now, I should point out in the case of the random forest data shown here, the training data set has been removed. So, so those catchments with known epithermal deposits are not included in this gridded percentile image. These, these are only catchments in the test data set that, that don't include known deposits. So right away, we can see a difference between a, a classical or conventional approach with machine learning. Now I should point out, the, the use of weighted sums model, this is, this is an expert driven system because the, the user decides not only what elements to include in the analysis, but also what importance to put on those different elements. So it, it comes down to having experience, but it also allows for a certain bias to come to the, the models that are being developed. But what really impressed me about the, the random forest approach was the ability for the algorithms to distinguish between subtle differences between deposit types. So I'm, I'm just showing a, a summary of, of um, gridded percentile images. Uh, and the images uh, are all random forests. And, and these are, if you like, normalized votes or uh, posterior probabilities plotted. So I've, I've included that epithermal example that we looked at previously. Uh, then we have alkalic porphyry copper gold deposits, and you can see we have a very nice trend, which does line up with known alkalic porphyry deposit types. Uh, then we had our, our more standard porphyry copper deposits, and again, they line up fairly well with known occurrences, and, and then porphyry moly deposits. And again, uh, known occurrence in here, and, and DACO sits down in here. So I was quite impressed with that. If I was tackling this using a conventional approach, I would have to develop weighted sums models for each of these different deposit types. And, and I wouldn't develop one weighted sums model. I'd be developing multiple weighted sums models. Then I would be visually comparing them to known occurrences as a way of trying to validate uh, which weighted sums model I felt was more successful. So quite time consuming, involves a, quite a large element of particular bias. Um, and is not entirely objective as, as well. So, so this convinced me that there was um, quite a bit of potential to some of these machine learning approaches. One of the other things we looked at was in, instead of just including the data and, and not the raw data, again, centered log ratio transform data, but how about if we did random forest and, and we used the results from a, a multiple regression analysis. So this is an approach for correcting the samples for a variable catchment lithology. 
So the idea was, well, it, could we improve on our random forest predictions if, if rather than just putting in the raw data and, and letting the algorithm sort it out, we, we gave them our best, uh, if you like, uh, leveled or clean data set that removes those effects related to the lithology. And you can see there, there's not a great deal of difference in, in the two products, but I, I was concerned that we may have been introducing some artifacts. Uh, for example, up here, we uh, this is the epithermal model again. Uh, we're generating a lot of uh, a lot of elevated scores in an area with no known epithermal deposits, and probably better known for um, nickel deposits and ultramafics. So uh, I was a little concerned that we might we in in trying to refine the model too much, we we've actually pushed it too far, and and we've uh, introduced artifacts into the interpretation. So I'll finish up with just very quickly another case study that Eric and I just completed last year. This was in, in the Quest South area. Um, again, a large data set, but only about eight and a half thousand samples at this point. Again, reanalyzed stream sediment samples. Uh, and we, in this case, we were more focused on the machine learning aspect of it. But I, I did do a little bit of conventional interpretation using a catchment analysis approach. Uh, for comparison with the machine learning uh, outputs. Uh, and the thing we trialed in this particular study was rather than using the raw data or the, the center log transform data, was to use principal components or we actually used TSNE um, components in the actual random forest inputs. And it turned out TSNE metrics appeared to work the best. The, as we, we found with uh, the Northwest BC study, training data was a challenge. We, we probably nearly put as much time in, into um, finalizing our training data set as we did to the actual uh, random forest analysis. You can see uh, from the pie chart on the left, we've got a lot of different deposits. In the end, we had to amalgamate some of them. Some of these deposit classes contain very few examples. So far too few to use for any sort of training data set. Uh, and so what we did, if based on geochemical similarity, is we amalgamated some of these models. Um, and, and I should say these are these are um, models that are were applied to particular occurrences by the Geological Survey of British Columbia. Um, and we excluded things like showing because we we thought there was too much ambiguity involved in in the designation of a deposit type to something that may only exist in a small outcrop. So we had to simplify and we excluded, and one of the one of the deposit types that caused us a lot of headaches, it caused us headaches in North, Northwest BC, and it caused us headaches again here, was something uh, known as polymetallic uh, silver lead zinc veins which comprise about 30% of, of all the mineral occurrences in the study area, uh, but it's quite vague as to what deposit type they might be associated with. And they, they have quite a wide variety of geochemistry. And we found if, if we took the polymetallic veins out of the training data set that we got a, a slightly better result. Not, a, not a, a huge improvement, but we were able to get a slightly higher um, proportion of, of um, success. And, and because of the internal validation involved in, in random forests, we could actually, for different deposit types, look at how accurate our prediction predictions were going to be. So, and, and again, we use uh, PCA and TSNE metrics. And we compare them and you can see uh, they're the same for some deposit types, but for other deposit types, TES and E gave a, a slightly higher prediction accuracy and an overall slightly higher accuracy. So we found that was the better product in the end to deal with. So uh, a quick comparison of a, a manual, if you like, or a conventional model. So a weighted sums model on the left that I've ca calculated, very simple weighted sums model. 
But um, one of the things I do like about the weighted sums model is it does allow you to account for several effects. So the, the copper and the moly are obviously are going to be two elements that we would expect to see elevated in porphyry copper deposits. But we've also included iron as a negative importance in the model because there is some evidence of potential metal scavenging occurring in the area. And, and so there is an influence on the copper in particular, um, which is correlating in part with the amount of iron in the samples. Uh, we, can, we can try to correct for that by including it as negative importance. And then we're comparing that to random forests using TSNE and, and using nine variables. So the end product was this. We uh, generated a series of catchment maps. So we went back to the catchments. And the good thing again with the catchments is, is once you've defined a catchment for your samples, we can thematically code that catchment with whatever parameter we've decided is, is our most useful parameter. And in this case, it's the porphyry copper moly model. Uh, and what we're plotting here are uh, percentiles of the posterior probability. So, so this area here, those of you familiar with Southern British Columbia uh, would know this is the Highland Valley Copper District over here. But you can see elsewhere, there are a number of catchments that are lighting up that do not appear to have any known occurrences associated with them, a few over here as well. So as I said previously, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're mineralized. Um, it, it, could, it could mean um, that there's something unusual about the geochemistry that, that the random forests are allocating that sample into a, a high probability for a certain deposit type. Uh, again, in my mind, these point the direction to those catchments you would want to go in and do further investigation of. So some of the conclusions from this work from a, if you like, a practical or applied point of view uh, was the importance of developing that, that good training data set and just how difficult that can be sometimes. Uh, we had to merge classes of deposits. Uh, we had a problem with polymetallic veins because they, they showed a lot of geochemical overlap with other deposit types. And there was an element of amb ambiguity, I, I suspect, it's a bit of a garbage can for occurrences where they don't know what deposit type to put them in, and they've got some base metals, maybe a bit of precious metals, they throw it into the polymetallic veins. And then we excluded the showings because we didn't feel that the deposit models were, um, would be clear based on the amount of available information. And, in the two different studies I showed you, we took two different approaches to how to attribute the training data set with the known mineral deposit occurrences we were using with training. In Northwest BC, we used catchments. So we, we basically lassoed the, the, the known occurrences with, with the catchment polygon. But the problem we had there is that some catchments contain multiple occurrences. Um, so, that, so it raises the question, what are you going to do there? In that case, what we did was we, we used the, the occurrence with the highest ranking. So if it was a, a, a former producer or a, an advanced prospect, then, then it became the deposit that we, we attributed uh, the samples for, for training purposes. But that, that's not necessarily going to be the case in all situations. For Quest South, we, we use distance and we played around with different distances uh, in terms of uh, sensitivity. If we, if we opened up the distance, of course, we captured more occurrences uh, to specific stream sediment samples, so our training set became bigger. So that's a good thing. But because we're using distance, it meant that some deposits would have been located downstream of the of stream sediment sample sites. So obviously, those deposits, if, if they're not large deposits, would not have an influence on those particular stream sediments. So, so then we had to collapse the, the, uh, the search uh, radius down to try not to be too big and not introduce that ambiguity. 
But in spite of some of these issues, I think we ended up with, with quite viable objective predictions. Um, and I, I was impressed enough to, to think that, you know, compared to some of our expert models, uh, they, they could, could well be superior um, compared to a more conventional approach. So I'll, I'll finish up there. I see, I see some questions have come through. So one question we had was, <clears throat> do you level the various data sets prior to applying the center log ratio? Uh, we did in the, in the case of Quest South, <clears throat> we did do a leveling, uh, but you have, to be, you have to be careful how you level the data. In that case, uh, we, we used, uh, we had data from two different laboratories, um, which is, was quite egalitarian of Geoscience BC to use a couple of different providers to, uh, to spread the work, but it resulted in creating some, some problems in, in leveling the data. So, so those data were, were leveled rather crudely, but in order to, to, uh, to not disrupt the, um, the, the nature of the data set so that we could then apply a center log ratio transform to the data. Um, class imbalances, uh, certainly they were there. And we, we um, simply had to accept them. It, it, in part, we tried to get around those class imbalances um, by consolidating classes. To, to try to, to bring in the, tra the training data set so it would have similar numbers of, of, um, of classes within each class for training purposes. But the, the, the nature of the data set meant that there, um, there was a lot of unevenness. So, so that was the problem we had with the data set. That we had um, a lot of work to, to try to get that training data set as good as we can get it. And in spite of, I think, some of the shortfalls in, in what we did, I think we ended up with some quite good predictions. So I'll, I'll just um, share my screen once more. If, if people want to, um, to take a look at any of this work in more detail, just do a screen capture of of the references that you can see now. And, and these are the references for all the work that I've referred to and, and some general references as well. <clears throat>